Welcome to the Functional Medicine Radio Show with your host, Dr. Carrie Drizga, known internationally as the Functional Medicine Doc. Dr. Carrie is committed to helping patients find the root cause of their health problems and fixing the cause with natural treatments so they can feel normal again. Dr. Carey is the founder of Functional Medicine Ontario and is the author of the hit book, Reclaim Your Energy and Feel Normal Again. Please welcome your host, Dr. Carrie Drizga. Hello, everybody, and welcome to the Functional Medicine Radio Show, the only Internet radio show dedicated to giving you real solutions to improve your health. Not only are they real solutions, but they're natural solutions as well. Because, as you know, the one and only true wealth you have is your health. I'm your host, Dr. Carrie Drizga, the Functional Medicine Doc, and I'm committed to helping you find the root cause of your health problem, fix the cause with natural treatments, so you can feel normal again and live your life to the fullest. My special guest today is Chantelle Reagan. Let me tell you a little bit about her. Chantelle is a doctor of pharmacy and is pursuing a certification from the Institute for Functional Medicine. In pharmacy school, she was always taught to use non-pharmacologic options wherever possible, but didn't quite take that to heart until her oldest son was diagnosed with ADHD. Her aha moment happened while she was reading The Wheat Belly Diet by Dr. William Davis. Excellent book. And it was from this experience that she developed the 4S approach to ADHD. Chantal, thank you so much for being my special guest today on this episode of the Functional Medicine Radio Show. Thank you so much, Dr. Carey. It's a pleasure to be here. You know, Chantal, actually you're the first guest that I have on uh, to talk about ADD, ADHD. Oh, fantastic. So that is, um, that's great. I don't know where you'd like to start, but I'm, I'm happy to just, you know, provide some overview of where we're at currently in the uh, conventional treatment for the, for the disorder. Yeah, there's a lot. There's a lot we could talk about. Sure. We're going to try and condense it to about a half hour here. So let's first start with the traditional Western medical approach. Like, how does a child get diagnosed, and what are the typical uh, treatment options? Sure. So there is a, a combination of what current practitioners use. They use um, questionnaires that are basically given to parents and teachers and they go through a series of questions that just assess um, functionality. I'm spe specifically speaking about ADHD in children but it can also apply to adults. So it's a set of questionnaires and depending on the score of that questionnaire the child can get um, can get diagnosed with ADHD. Additionally there's some other you know practitioners that have uh, a few more things that they, they can do, they, they look at. Um, but by and large, um, the, the mode of treatment right now is medication along with behavioral modification. Um, oftentimes, behavioral modification is tried first and may or may not be successful. So medications are started quite frequently soon thereafter. A couple of years ago, there was a study in the uh, American Journal of Pediatrics that looked at which mode of treatment people were using, and this was in school-aged children, uh, 3 to 17. And you might remember some headline news that was, you know, about 50% of uh, preschoolers were even using ADHD medications. So it's, it's definitely the mainstream. And, you know, there are so many things that we'll get into, I'm sure, in this interview that you can address before you even try to go that route. Okay, so then what is the functional medicine approach to ADHD? So the functional medicine approach, I think, you know, as you pointed out with your new book coming out, it all starts in the gut. The gut is really our um, avenue for a lot of our chronic diseases. And what, what I found is that gut disorder can not only manifest as gastrointestinal or stomach uh, disorders, but it could, it's very much related to the brain. We know that 85% of the serotonin that we make is in our gut. So they're very much related. Um, and a leaky gut can manifest uh, with ADHD symptoms. So we definitely want to try to um, understand what level of leaky gut someone has. There's also a variety of vitamin and mineral deficiencies that can, can often um, be mistaken as ADHD symptoms. 
And so you know, we're addressing things like the, on a micronutrient level, maybe getting some testing for that um, as well. And that can really, um, that can really help uh, functionality, especially in the brain. We Go ahead. Okay, so I, I just wanted to kind of stop there and kind of go back a little bit uh, because you were mentioning leaky gut, which I know what leaky gut is and you know what leaky gut is, but some of our listeners aren't quite familiar with that term. Sure. So can you just kind of give us the basics of what does that mean? What is a leaky gut and why yes. is that bad? Yep. So in our intestinal lining, we have um, junctions and basically uh, molecule, molecules can get passed back and forth through that. And, and normally when they're tight, um, things are functioning properly. The, the gut is, is intact and fun functioning properly. But any kind of irritant, whether that be um, something that we're allergic to, a food, a medication, um, anything, in, you know, some sort of funky chemical in our environment can break down those tight junctures and allow some of these uh, molecules to get through. And it basically sort of creates this reaction and, again, can manifest as, you know, stomach symptoms and depression and ADHD and a whole host of other things. So on a, the most simplified level, that's really what, uh, you know, how I like to explain the leaky gut. And uh, so I'm so glad that you've kind of uh, explained that for our listeners because that's like one of the most basic fundamental concepts that a lot of the health problems that people have, like it often stems from a leaky gut. So like we always in functional medicine want to see like, is there a leaky gut? And then why is there a leaky gut? Exactly. Yeah. So, you know, there's, there's many ways to, to sort of go about that. Um, one of the things that, you know, often is, you know, not addressed, I sort of, I think at a, at a root cause could be some sort of allergen. What are you putting into your body or what is around you in your environment? And that's one of the first things that I would take a look at is just, you know, at a, at a, at a functional level, what's going in. Okay, so, so let's talk a little bit more about that because I think a lot of uh, listeners out there suspect, well, not that they suspect, but they understand that there could be a component of food allergies yes. and food sensitivities. You know, kind of going back to your bio, um, talking about how, you know, you read the book, The Wheat Belly by Dr. Yes. William Davis, and that, that, that really kind of gave you that aha moment. I think a lot of people actually have that moment that, yeah, it really could be as simple as there are food sensitivities going on, and yes, they can create this much chaos with your health. Right. So I think, you know, there are a handful, five or six of the most common allergenic foods. So we have wheat, corn, soy, dairy, eggs, and... Soy, uh, wheat, gluten, corn, dairy, eggs, soy. I think those are the, the basics. So at a, at a fundamental level, there's been a lot of studies that have been done, especially in ADHD, with um, some of these food sensitivities. And, you know, there is conflicting uh, data out there as to whether, you know, gluten causes ADHD or, or um, soy or dairy. But there, there are fairly, you know, decent links to gluten and dairy. Um, I find that a lot of the people that I work with, once removing those two um, foods, you know, experience a, a lot of symptom relief. And, you know, that, that's not to say that that's it. You know, certainly there are um, tests that you can get. There is some, in the, the medical community, there's some um, conflict as to whether food sensitivity testings are truly accurate. Some people think that just, you know, an elimination diet might be the best way to determine what actually works best for you. In other words, um, I may react, I might, my food sensitivity test may come back normal for gluten, but if I take it out of my diet and I get rid of my ADHD symptoms, then there was definitely something there. So there are definitely are tests that we can do and, and um, even simple elimination diets are, um, are very helpful. Excellent. So again, that list was gluten, wheat, corn, soy, dairy, and eggs. Yes. And so for the listeners out there who, let's say, some of them have already tried that. They've already tried that approach. They've tried an elimination diet. They've tried removing these basic foods. And they don't really see much of a change. 
what's the next thing that they should be thinking about? Well, I would actually really strongly, I've, I've been involved in elimination diets when people don't really get it all out. So, you know, I'll sort of try to refine that as to a level two, just to make sure that, um, you know, we're really making, we're really making a good attempt to, to determine whether or not that's the case. <laughs> I like um, that you say that. <laughs> yeah. So, you know, I, I definitely think there's, uh, there's some, it, it's, it can be very intimidating, but at the same time, if you can, you can do it in a slow manner and still get some benefits. So um, definitely have some suggestions for that. Uh, but in a, you know, w once we're past that phase, there are the other um, environmental toxins that I think really um, go a long way with you know, reducing some of them. There's so many great, we know that the skin is our largest organ and, and there's so many great natural skincare products right now because basically what you normally find in your grocery stores or in your local you know, pharmacies even is just full of toxic chemicals. But if you can refine some of those products that you're using, on, particularly on your skin, on your body, on a daily basis, that can really reap some benefits as well with helping with um, the leaky gut. We also, I also like to suggest um, just you know, incorporating some probiotic foods. Before we even get into um, probiotic supplements, I think just you know, trying to you know, sort of shift some of that um, the gut mi microbiome, which is basically, you know, the, your, your chemical makeup in, in your gut and your intestines. Um, so things like um, grass-fed yogurt and uh, raw sauerkraut and kimchi and things like that can, can really also um, be beneficial. Okay, fantastic. So let's switch gears here because something else you mentioned early on in our conversation was about there are certain vitamins and minerals that can potentially be deficient and actually create a lot of the different symptoms of yes. ADHD. So can you talk about that? Yeah, for sure. So um, there's, you know, there's some evidence that uh, omega-3 fatty acids, so Things like when you're thinking of foods, uh, things like salmon and fatty fish, um, um, we also can you know get that in a supplement form. But looking at the uh, the whole foods form is is a great way to do that because basically the two the components of omega three fatty acids really support a healthy brain. Um, it's also good for cardiovascular health, but for sure we're trying to incorporate more omega threes into the diet. Um, also, krill is also krill oil has also been shown to be beneficial in um, ADHD and could possibly be a little less, uh, a little more um, bioavailable, meaning it can get get into our bodies a little bit easier. So those are two. I think the, one of the switching over to sort of vitamin deficiencies, the B vitamins. I always think of B vitamins as B for the brain. They're so important. There's eight of them. Um, we know that particularly B6 pyridoxine makes our neurotransmitters. So um, that's really important for things like serotonin. B12, methyl B12 can help regenerate some of our brain neurons as well as the, the myelin sheath that protects them. So absolutely um, critical. Other micronutrients that I think are really important and sometimes deficient are things like magnesium. We, it's very synergistic to one of the B vitamins, vitamin B6, and we know that about 80% of our population is deficient. So um, really important to just sort of re replenish magnesium. There's easy things like taking an Epsom salt bath. There are some magnesium oil sprays. Um, but you have to sort of watch the dose because it can cause a little bit of diarrhea depending on um, what you're taking the form and, and how it's being uh, absorbed. Another critical vitamin is vitamin D. And we know that about 50% of children are deficient in vitamin D. It is really critical for our bones, our immune function, um, and just you know general health as well. So I live um, in the Northeast near Philadelphia. So for sure in the winter, we're not getting out in the sun at all. So I'm sure to have myself and my family take a vitamin D3 supplement during those times. But, you know, you can 
very easily just step out into the sun for a few minutes just to, to get that during the, the uh, spring and summertime. I'll just go through two real other quick ones, Dr. Carey. Zinc is also a critical um, uh, micronutrient in, in ADHD. It's really essential for dopamine synthesis, which is, affects our mood, it affects our concentration, and it also converts vitamin B6 into its active form, so it helps the B, the B vitamins as well. Um, so incredibly important for uh, for reducing symptoms as well, just making sure the zinc levels are optimal. And then lastly, iron is another one that I find to be um, significant. There was a study a while back that looked at children with ADHD, and 84% of them had significantly lower levels of iron compared with 18% of kids without ADHD. So really good to get ferritin levels checked by a practitioner. You want to make sure you don't have too much because it can block other things like zinc, copper, and manganese. So just sort of keeping those in check. And I always recommend working with a practitioner to understand what your levels are before blindly supplementing. Okay, so again, to recap, we talked about essential fatty acids and krill oil, B vitamins, especially B6 and B12, magnesium, vitamin D, zinc, and iron. And I have to say, Chantal, that is a terrific list. And I have used many of those nutrients in my private practice. I usually actually don't see children in my private practice, mm -hmm. but for the adults that come in, so many adults are struggling with anxiety, depression, and poor concentration, and poor memory, and they feel like they have adult ADD or adult ADHD, right. and maybe they do, but yeah, so for the listeners out there, these things can help with kids who are struggling, they can help with adults that are struggling. Chantel, with patients who suspect they might have these deficiencies, what are your recommendations as far as do, do we test these patients, do we just give them a bottle of supplements and say, try this for 30 days, let's see what happens. How do you approach that? I really like to test. I think that you don't know what you don't know. And um, there is, here in the States, we have a test by SpectraCell that looks at all of those micronutrients. And there's some tests that you can get just through your traditional doctors, you know, vitamin D level and things like that. Um, but, you know, sometimes we're so low, for example, in vitamin D that you need like almost a mega dose. So I really wouldn't like yeah, to, yeah. To, to treat that blindly. So for sure, you know, things like um, I mentioned before, the omegas and the krills, you're not going to test for that, but you can always supplement in your diet. And that's always a, um, a benefit. But for the, the vitamins and minerals, I absolutely recommend testing. Yeah, that spectra cell test is a great test, and it also tells you a little bit about some of the amino acids. Yes, absolutely. Which we didn't even, we, we didn't, we didn't even get we into didn't that We get yet. into, yes, <laughs> yeah, yeah. That could be like a whole other show. I, I think so, yes. <laughs> okay, so let's kind of switch gears and talk about your 4S approach. Sure, yes. Yeah. So when I, as you mentioned, you know, I struggled with my son who was going through this um, very early in life. He was... Um, just coming out of preschool, so we talked about that study before, and I wasn't, I'm a pharmacist, I just wasn't ready to go down that road of medication at such a young age. So we came up with a structured approach once we figured out some of the, um, the food sensitivities. Um, I, I consider stress, both stress that you're putting on the body, it could be emotional or physical stress. Um, so stress starting with what are you putting in? So we talked about those four, those five key allergens, and maybe you know removing those or doing some sense, food sensitivity testing. Uh, I think that is is critical. But also another component of uh, stress is just you know that that physical stress or that emotional stress that we think of, where we're running around and we um, are just always on overdrive. So it's just taking some simple practices within your day, whether that's some deep breathing, some, um, you know, one thing I like to do or recommend to people is the, um, Dr. Weil has, a, a, I think it's a four, seven, eight breathing technique or five, seven, eight. I can't remember exactly what it is, but it's basically hold your breath for five seconds, um, or inhale for five seconds, hold your breath for seven seconds and exhale for eight seconds. And that any time of day can really just de-stress and, and reduce 
you know, all of that uh, busy activity going on within your body. So simple breathing activities, I could go on, we could do a whole show on, on this as well, um, but that seems to work well, especially with the, the pediatric population. Um, so that's sort of stress, but there's, you know, many other things. We have the environmental stresses, the, the chemical toxins, and things like I mentioned with, you know, just cleaning up the products that you use on an everyday basis. Um, this, the, this other one is sugar, and sugar is uh, a key component, and, and we all know the stories of, you know, sugaring kids up, and they're running around like um, crazy people because they have too much sugar, but there's really something to be said for that. There is, um, you know, some literature to su support that sugar does play an impact in ADHD symptoms. And I'm not talking about just, you know, white table sugar. Sugar is in a lot of the foods, processed foods that we eat. So simply by eliminating a lot of those processed foods, you're going to be reducing the sugar that is in, uh, you know, refined carbohydrate products that you might buy, you know, in the grocery store. Um, so balancing the, the blood sugar is another key, key component under that sugar uh, bucket. So how do we do that? We can, you know, have some protein when we do eat carbohydrate. Um, again, reducing those refined sugars and, and carbs and then increasing some of the healthier fats we talked about, like those omega-3 sources, the fatty fish, um, anti-inflammatory oils like coconut or olive oil, um, and just, you know, eating that rainbow, eating the rainbow of real foods, nutrient-dense real foods can really uh, uh, help balance that blood sugar and just reduce the overall sugar uh, content. So we hit stress, we hit sugar. The third one is sleep, and that really is critical. I see it with both um, kids and adults. It's so underrated how important sleep is in just our daily life. So, um, you know, really making a habit of having that, that ritual of going to bed at the same time. It sounds incredibly boring, doesn't it? But it, it's just so crucial and beneficial. We don't even realize how much children need. They need like anywhere between, um, you know, nine to 12 hours, depending on how old they are. Just simple things like um, eliminating screen time, at least an hour before bedtime, Take having those calming rituals like, you know, reading books or uh, taking a bath with those magnesium salts or even, you know, blocking out some of the um, the the lights you can wear those yellow goggles if you've seen them they're they're blue light blockers and that can really increase the melatonin and help have um, productive sleep so that's the um, the third s stress sugar sleep and the fourth is supplementation so we talked you know a little bit about that in what we just discussed in terms of the um, vitamin and mineral deficiencies. So it was the, you know, the omega-3s, uh, the krill oil, things like probiotics. If we're at a point where we feel like that leaky gut could be repopulated with some good bacteria, there are um, some excellent probiotic supplements on the market, but I will caution you to really uh, pay attention to the brand that you're buying and where you're buying it from. Nine times out of ten, if you go into a local pharmacy, that probiotic that's sitting on that shelf probably isn't stable enough to do the job that it can do, should do in your body and, and really isn't even effective. So most of the um, probiotics that I recommend, if they're worth any weight, are usually refrigerated. There's a couple of shelf-stable soil-based probiotics that are also good as well. Um, but just you know, make sure that you, you really do get what you pay for in terms of supplements. There, I'll just quickly tell you this story. There was a study done in the state of New York that looked at um, Walgreens pharmacies, and I think at eight out of ten of the Walgreens pharmacies that they that they assessed, the supplements that they took off the shelf actually didn't have the ingredients that were listed uh, in you know on the label in the product. So to me, that was, you know, sort of a wake-up call for everybody to just really be aware of supplement brands. They're not regulated, you know, here in the United States by the FDA, so we really have to be careful about, you know, what we choose. So we talked about probiotics. We talked about the um, omega-3 fatty acids or krill. We talked about the B vitamins. We talked about magnesium, vitamin D, zinc. The antioxidants are also really important, and they're sort of what I call the building blocks of 
um, you know, all of our cellular health. Glutathione is a master antioxidant. That's, you know, a great thing to, um, to supplement when you're under the care of a practitioner. Um, and, you know, I think just for, for um, time's sake, Dr. Carey, that's probably, uh, that's probably it in terms of my, my four S's. There are also, you know, a lot of things that we'll get into in terms of um, other alternative treatments that can certainly help neurofeedback, um, essential oils. There's all these other things that I like to call, um, you know, not necessarily magic bullets, but they certainly can be uh, a great addition to, um, you know, a functional medicine approach depending on, um, you know, how and, and, and what you want to focus your time and attention on. Yeah, this whole arena of ADHD, it's a pretty big one. It's huge. So we, we just scratched the surface here today. But you we gave did. us some really great information, some really great basics to get our listeners started. And Chantal, I would love if you could come back on and we can do a part two to this and we can talk about the amino acids. Oh, and yes. Talk about breathing techniques and some of these other like complementary treatments as well. Absolutely. I would love to. Okay, so Chantal, how can our listeners find out more about you and where can they learn about your 4S program? Sure, great. So I currently blog at Functional Pharmacist, and that's F-A-R-M, pharmacist.com. And you can, you know, follow me there. I am also on Facebook and Instagram and um, just trying to bring you the most, um, you know, basic approaches for functional medicine, both for ADHD and just for chronic disease in general. So you can learn more about um, the program there and certainly email me if you have any questions. So I'll make sure that those links are in the podcast notes so that our listeners can easily find you. Fantastic. Chantal, thank you so much for being my special guest today. This has been an awesome interview. It was a pleasure. Thank you so much. All right, that wraps up this very special episode of the Functional Medicine Radio Show with Chantal Reagan. And I want to thank you, our listeners, for tuning in today. And I'd like to invite you back next week for another episode of the Functional Medicine Radio Show. As always, I'm your host, Dr. Kiri Drizga, the Functional Medicine Doc. Have a great week, everyone. You've been listening to the Functional Medicine Radio Show with your host, Dr. Kerry Drizga, known internationally as the Functional Medicine Doc. Dr. Carey is committed to helping patients find the root cause of their health problems and fixing the cause with natural treatments so they can feel normal again. Dr. Carey is the founder of Functional Medicine Ontario and is the author of the hit book, Reclaim Your Energy and Feel Normal Again. Please tell your friends about the Functional Medicine Radio Show, and we'll see you next week with more from Dr. Carey.